On 18 December, United Nations forces are defending two widely separated areas. In the Hungnam Beachhead area, U.S. 10th Corps troops and other U.N. units are holding back Chinese forces estimated at four corps. With the aid of U.S. naval and air support, the evacuation continues in this narrowing perimeter. On the Western Front, near the 38th parallel, the enemy massing for the past three weeks. A general offensive is expected at any time. On the right flank in this sector, enemy units have pushed South Korean forces below the parallel. Two weeks after the evacuation began at Hung Nam, this tremendous operation is drawing to a close. It is described as one of the most valiant defensive actions in history. Thousands of lives are saved. President Truman states, this is the best Christmas present I've ever had. The story of the Hung Nam evacuation began when the end of the Korean War was in sight. In November, UN forces had reached the strategic hydroelectric reservoirs of North Korea and were speeding toward the Manchurian border. Then, Red China entered the fight. What was first thought to be only a token force of Chinese quickly grew to tremendous odds. UN troops were forced into complete withdrawal. Beginning on 12 December, 105,000 troops had to be removed at Hung Nam. 17,500 vehicles and 350,000 tons of equipment. 100,000 refugees are removed. These people swarm to the water's edge, practically swamping the transportation available. At this time, the beachhead, which had originally included the city of Ham Hung, five miles inland, has narrowed to a small strip of beach. Over these people's heads, Navy shells are pouring into Ham Hung, and the rear guard is holding on until the last possible minute. The whole 10th Corps and most of its equipment is being evacuated in this operation. It is completed in only 11 days. The 10th Corps included the 1st Marine Division, the 3rd and 7th Infantry Divisions, and South Korean elements. Equipment that cannot be carried away by ship or plane must be destroyed and every foot of shipping space is filled. Helping in the rescue and the beachhead defense are troops of the 3rd Division, which had been fighting in the south. Certain supplies, such as sacks of flour, are given to the native Koreans who hustle away with all they can carry. A few of these Koreans are in for a disappointment, however. Some bags resembling flour sacks contain fertilizer. It is amazing that anything is accomplished in this turmoil of activity, but it is an orderly evacuation. Despite the rubble of old bombing raids, the milling thousands of refugees, and the mass of supplies scattered throughout this core depot, troops and vehicles move calmly to their designated loading points. The evacuation of the wounded continues. Although the more serious cases have been loaded on earlier ships or taken out by air, wounded keep coming in from the defense perimeter. General MacArthur states that the casualty cost is less than in a comparable period during the summer defense of the Pusan beachhead. Landing craft form an endless conveyor belt running out to the transports which are waiting in the harbor. On hand here is a U.S. Navy amphibious fleet commanded by Rear Admiral James H. Doyle, supported by the 7th Fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral A.D. Struble. Vice Admiral C. Turner Joy, commander of the United Nations Naval Forces, compares this evacuation with the landing at Incheon. He states that such an operation has never been attempted before, but it proved that an army can be redeployed by sea with as little loss as in a landing. 
The Hung Nam evacuation is called an amphibious landing in reverse. This is the fifth major amphibious operation in Korea. Landings have been made at Pohang, Incheon, Wonsan, and Iwan. Busan. This port with nearby Pohang is the destination of troops and supplies evacuated from Hongnam. As UN troops come ashore here instead of in Japan, Korean hopes are raised that a new line is to be drawn in Korea and that complete evacuation of the peninsula is not contemplated. Landing nets are used to speed the debarkation. These men are being regrouped in the original triangular beachhead in South Korea. The defense perimeter here, if it is eventually used as it was before, includes Pohang on the east, Pusan in the south, and Masan on the west. But far across the peninsula in the northwest, the battle for Seoul is pending, and no detailed line has been established in Korea at this time. Everything depends on the next move of the Chinese and the strength with which they move. Seoul during Christmas week. A full-scale Chinese drive on this capital city is expected at any moment. Civilian refugees are abandoning the city at a rate of 80,000 per day. Transportation is the chief difficulty, for the refugees must take second priority to the shipment of munitions and troops. This is the second time many of these civilians have fled Seoul. Now, practically the entire population is fleeing the Reds. A few miles to the north of Seoul, UN troops are withdrawing in the face of overwhelming Chinese forces. The entire 8th Army is being redeployed. The Chinese have established an anchor at Wachon to the east. They are massing at Korang Po, below the parallel, and they are building up armor at Kesong, north of Seoul. In this sector near Seoul, there is little contact during the withdrawal. As UN troops move below the 38th parallel, it is estimated that a force of 100,000 Chinese are preparing to move toward Seoul. While General Ridgway is flying to Korea to take over his new command, new lines are forming well south of the 38th parallel. South Korean guerrilla troops act as rear guard as they follow the withdrawal to the south. At Taegu, 8th Army convoys moving south from the 38th parallel battle lines fill the city's streets. Everywhere in South Korea at this time, there is redeployment and preparations for the big battle to come. But as this battle shapes up on the western coast, the UN finds itself in a much better position than it was a few weeks before. UN supply lines are shorter, Chinese supply lines are much longer. This will be an historic test of manpower against firepower. Men of the 187th Regimental Combat Team in bivouac near Suwon, 18 miles south of Seoul, carry on camp routine despite sub-freezing temperatures. Even the frigid weather cannot dampen spirits when there's mail from home. Morale is high as the soldiers rest up from the fighting and do their Christmas shopping by Trans-Pacific Mail. It takes more than falling mercury to keep a soldier from rattling the dice. In spite of the mission, carries on. The company barber carries on business as usual. His shop is a little drafty, but the men, hardened to the Korean winter, scarcely seem to notice the beginnings of a snowstorm. Blizzard does not prevent this man from getting his shave. A humorous hometown paper reminds two soldiers of a more pleasant climate in Tucson, Arizona. 
these men seem to realize that if they weren't fighting in this Korean snowstorm, they might someday be forced to fight the Reds in their homeland. More fuel is prepared for the hungry fires as the snow deepens, covering the bivouac area with a heavy blanket. A hot sponge bath and that clean feeling give a boost to the spirit. An inverted helmet is the standard wash basin. Writing a letter home isn't easy when snowflakes smudge your paper. Fighting off the bitter cold is almost a full-time job in itself. Inner warmth is supplied by hot chow. A soldier spreads jam on his pancake and fuels up to restore energy which is quickly used up at these temperatures. Hot coffee hits the spot and helps to keep you warm when you're camping out in a December snowdrift. These American soldiers in winter bivouac are proving that they are tough physically. Their cheerful adaptability to adversity proves that their morale matches their physical condition. At Sibyon Ni in the western sector of Korea, an L-5 takes off to direct artillery fire upon enemy targets. Aerial observation by light planes of the artillery team has been consistently valuable in laying down accurate fire in the path of the advancing red. Enemy activity has been reported on Hill 311 in this area. On the ground, an artillery battery of the 1st Cavalry Division plots the target. Men of the 1st and 2nd sections of the battery go into action when the call comes for the fire mission. The battery's fire direction section utilizes the air observer's information to direct firing. Sibyon Ni, where UN troops are making a stand, is 21 miles north of the 38th parallel. The 155s lay down a barrage on Hill 311. As a result of fire from this battery, several towns are set ablaze, slowing down the advance of the Chinese Red. By 26 December, all UN forces have redeployed and new positions have been established north of Seoul. 10th Corps troops have carried out an orderly evacuation from the Hungnam beachhead and are being landed in the Pohang Pusan area in the south. In the western sector, UN forces are counterattacking northeast of Chuncheon. Red troops advancing toward Seoul have pushed through the town of Korangpo. As these positions are formed, the readjustment forced by the Chinese intervention is now completed. The black crepe of morning drapes the colors as General Walker's body is brought to Tokyo. General MacArthur and other high-ranking officers honor the courageous 8th Army commander whose stubborn tenacity and fighting spirit, evidenced during the darkest days of the Korean campaign, had earned him the title of Little Bulldog. General Walker, killed at the age of 61, was a veteran of 42 years of Army service. He entered West Point in 1908 and served in both World Wars. During World War II, he commanded the 20th Corps under General Patton. The stocky general distinguished himself in Korea by his determined defense of the Pusan perimeter, although his force was outnumbered by the attacking communists. Later, after the Chinese intervention, he brought his 8th Army back from the North Korean mountains in orderly withdrawal 
despite frantic attempts by the enemy to cut off and isolate his troops. A modest funeral service, attended by General Walker's family and personal friends, was held in Tokyo on Christmas Day. General MacArthur, who last October had decorated General Walker for personal bravery, issued this statement. General Walker, as 8th Army commander, proved himself a brilliant military leader, whom I had just recommended for promotion to full general. His gallantry in action has been an inspiration to all who have served with him, and his loss will be keenly felt, not only by our own country, but by those allied with us in defense of freedom. Flags fly at half-mast over the Daiichi building in Tokyo as a period of mourning is officially proclaimed. General Walker's body was later returned to the United States for burial in a hero's grave at Arlington National Cemetery. Supporting United Nations military operations in Korea, a lone PBM returns to its base. This plane is one of a trio of unescorted Allied flying boats that had taken off 12 hours earlier, each going its separate way to help search out submarines, detect and destroy minefields, and observe and report enemy activity. Day and night, the air patrol goes on. Before a returning plane is even in sight of the seaplane tender that services it and directs its operations, another has taken its place on the around-the-clock patrol of Korean danger zones. Mission completed, the big flying boat needs an engine checkup, a refueling job, and a new crew, so it can be on its way again. Each member of the crew takes his station as the PBM pulls alongside the aircraft tender, USS Curtis, to be hoisted aboard for servicing. It's a ticklish job that calls for men who have been trained to work as a team. Getting the aircraft safely aboard without injury to equipment or personnel is the responsibility of the air officer on the tender. 35 tons of naval aircraft hang by a single steel cable. On the hangar deck of the Curtis, men with fend-off poles help to protect the patrol boat from damage and ease it into position. Crew members give special concern to the propeller blades. A slight bump might mean serious damage to the engines as well as the propellers. Once an operation of this nature has been begun, every action must be carried out surely and as fast as safety will permit. There are casualty and fire hazards involved in handling the 35-ton PBMs. In addition, an enemy air attack, while a PBM is aboard, might jeopardize the security of the entire ship. The aircraft carries its beaching gear with it to cover emergencies when it might have to make a forced landing and handle its own emergency repairs. The big wheels lock securely into place. Cowling comes off and checkup and repairs on the engines are conducted at top speed. There's only one aim, get the PBM back into first-rate operating condition and off the hangar deck as rapidly as possible. Matters like replacing the cowling can be handled well enough after the aircraft is safely back in the water. A tender of the Curtis class may service as many as 18 PBMs. This calls for speed in servicing each aircraft. Another PBM may be waiting or may arrive momentarily. And there's one more important matter that must be promptly attended to if the PBM is to be more than a floating target, gasoline. Engines repaired and tuned up, the PBM will be ready to serve its squadron again as soon as it can be refueled and get its new orders. In 
addition to serving as floating gasoline stations, the smaller class tenders can support six planes with limited maintenance work which does not involve hoisting an aircraft onto the deck. To reduce fire hazards, aircraft are not refueled until after they've been repaired. On the planes, it's the crews who do the work, but not necessarily a single crew. Under some circumstances, it may be most practical to keep planes in the air almost constantly, sending them out with fresh crews the moment they've been checked and refueled. It takes a crew of nine to man a PBM. Two pilots, a navigator, radio man, ordnance man, and seaman. A plane is never left without at least a skeleton complement of one officer and two men who can keep the engines turning in case of a storm. Jato cylinders are put into place. After the takeoff, they'll be jettisoned. And so another U.S. Navy plane is back on the job with its United Nations task force. Aerial patrol activity is a cooperative United Nations effort, like other military operations in the Korean theater. Officers of a British Sunderland flying boat, who are part of the same task force, get their briefing before taking off for the day's mission. They'll intercept the patrol plane they will relieve when it's halfway back to its base and will carry on with the work of observing enemy movements, sighting and exploding enemy mines, and perhaps most important, watching for submarines. If the sub is sighted, sonar buoys will be dropped so that radar signals will go out to destroyers. The big four-motored Sunderlands operate well in conjunction with two-motored PBMs. They're equipped to sleep for and take good care of their crews while they carry out their highly important work. in contact with the pilot of the aircraft through the intercom, even while preparing meals. Yes, a lot of things can happen that are a good deal more important than frying eggs to order, but until they do happen, it's business as usual, and breakfast on board makes it possible to cut minutes from the time of takeoff. Floating mines are detonated by machine gun fire from the circling aircraft. Similar mines washed ashore were found to have been made in Russia. Finally, at the end of its 12-hour tour of duty, the patrol boat closes up shop temporarily to come back to the task force base for another engine recheck, refueling, a brief rest for the crew, and a new mission. January, the second communist invasion of South Korea is a little over a week old, and UN troops are withdrawing along most of the line. In the center, the important rail and road junction city of Wonju is under heavy attack by Red forces. Loss of Wonju will seriously imperil the main United Nations southward withdrawal route. 
To the west, units of the Allied 8th Army fall back from Suwon before stiff pressure by Chinese divisions. Going into its sixth continuous day of intensive combat, the Air Force curtails its activity somewhat because of low ceilings and snow. 